uplift the stories of Black entrepreneurs past and present. And I just want to pause and say thank you to Ray Wood and thank you to Michelle um, Burnett Brown. Brown Burnett, sorry, um, our partner. We couldn't be here. Are you here representing Green? Oh, I thought you raised your hand. Oh, is it? <laughs> Michelle, we got a present in the audience. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you so much. We couldn't have done this without you all at Greenwood, and we're uh, so grateful for the partnership. So, why black gold? Making 36 degrees north an inclusive place is one of our goals. Uh, we want to make 36 degrees north look like Tulsa. And we recognize that Black Wall Street is critical when speaking, uh, speaking about entrepreneurship in Tulsa's uh, economy. And we wanted to also get the right people to get the conversation with us, which is why we partnered with Greenwood Greenwood Cultural Center. We saw, and you probably saw too, like with the Centennial, there's so many different things and people that are coming to Tulsa um, and so many great people and things that are happening. Um, a lot of initiatives being brought here. We're grateful for those, and we see this as an opportunity to highlight um, the Tulsans that have been here doing great things. So that's what we want to do. We want, we're highlighting some of the amazing stories of the people who built Black Wall Street and Greenwood and tying them to the stories of some of Tulsa's best and brightest modern day entrepreneurs. Here at 36 Degrees North, we pride ourselves on being Tulsa's base camp for entrepreneurs themselves. And we, our whole mission is to help entrepreneurs take themselves to the next level. Our whole reason for being is to help entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship thrive in our city. And we do this by providing inspiring workspace, a tight-knit community, and resources to get entrepreneurs to the next step in their journey. Again, Greenwood Cultural Center is our partner. I want to tell you just a little bit about them. Greenwood Cultural Center serves as a marker for the Tulsa community, chronicling where we have been, where we are, and where we're going through historical offerings, events, and youth programs. Mission is promoting, preserving, and celebrating African American culture and heritage. And if you want to know more about Greenwood Cultural Center, if you have never heard of them or want to visit their site, please go to greenwoodculturalcenter.org. Okay, so that's a little bit about me, 36, Greenwood Cultural Center, but y'all see I'm not up here by myself, right? You all see this beautiful lady right here? This is our guest today, Tierra Crawford. Let's give Tierra a hand. So Tierra is a member at 36 Degrees North. I'm so honored to have you um, as a member and she's an entrepreneur. I'm going to read her bio real quick and then we'll jump into your story in your words. Okay. Tierra was born and raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma. She is the mother of three, a caregiver, and an entrepreneur. She has birthed an enterprise within the creative industry. She has a production company called Sela. Did I say Sela right? Sela Productions Incorporated and a talent agency called Sela Model and Company LLC. Listen to this, y'all. With 20 plus years in the bank. You sure? I'm not saying nothing. That's not my business. That's your business, but I'm just going to be sure. With 20 plus years in the fashion industry, she is currently working towards developing a school named the House of Sela. That house, that will house, develop, and social sponsor local creative entrepreneurs. If you would help me. Welcome again, our speaker for the evening, Ms. Tierra Crawford. Tierra, how are you doing? I'm great, Tara. I'm good. Why do I feel like when you were, how you doing? <laughs> Wait. All right? Yes. Ooh, I'm not getting much of that part. But um, I want to know that I read your bio and I see you a lot around here. And I've always been inspired by you. Um, fun fact, y'all, I was introduced to Tierra years ago when my cousin said, you should go to this fashion show with me. My friend Tierra is doing a fashion show. And I think he said that that was probably one of the first one. It was actually at the Greenwood Cultural Center. It was the first one ever. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That was 2005. Wow. Wow. So I went and I was like, wow, it's amazing. Never did I think later we would be sitting here today. But I'm going to full circle. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So tell me a little bit, tell us about you. 
Tell us about, I mean, I know I read the Bible, but we want to know about you. I want to know how did you get into entrepreneurship? Um, just all of that. Like, yeah, what sure. made you want to go into fashion? So um, I went to school to pursue um, a science degree in fashion design and technology. And I was an academy in Florida. And then I came back to Tulsa and I really didn't have a way to actually exercise my degree. And so I started to just try and make a way out of no way, kind of that situation where um, I wanted to put on fashion shows and get involved um, with my community and let them know about what I was going through, through um, social awareness with the disease I call endometriosis that uh, my mom and my grandmother and other ladies in my family um, that have dealt with kind of a hormonal imbalances and, and just really chronic pain. And so um, from there, I decided to put on my first fashion show for endometriosis and we called it Shrek. And um, there was a background even further into that. I used to uh, kind of take in young ladies and um, people who were runaways, uh, dropouts, different things, um, going through personal you know, problems. And I would have them at my house and I would teach them how to sew. And so it just kind of all really just evolved into something really organic, you know, uh, with um, the first strut fashion show. So then I had that show and then it just became something I did annually, annually. And then I started to work more with talent. Um, I had agents who come to my fashion shows and say, hey, you're training. And every time you train someone, they come to our agency thinking they're a model now, and they get in and they pass, you know, um, our scores. And so they always say, well, we got trained with Sela. So, um, but we see that you're not an agent. So what do you think about coming into the industry? And I really just didn't like the idea at the time of being an agent. And I really was just kind of like, the industry is a devil, you know? <laughs> and, you know, I'm over here on this side. And so, um, but, I eventually got worn out by one particular person. Um, um, his name was Brett Smith, the, the great, and he recruited me and brought me into um, the agency world. And I worked as a trainer. And then maybe about, maybe three months later, I was promoted into an agency director in Tulsa. And then I took on another branch in Oklahoma City and another branch in Dallas. And there, Kind of evolved, and I still had the strut fashion show the production company, and so um, I just started to kind of make a name for myself in different communities, not just my own. And so it just kind of really expanded, and I decided to open up my own talent agency, and I really just started to learn about the business and learn what I didn't like about the business, what I wouldn't stand for with the business, and what I wanted to do, and. It kind of evolved into me really trying to find my space and what my purpose is here on this planet and my mission here as a you know Tulsa. And that's kind of where we're here to finish out the conversation, I guess, about today with starting a school called the House of Selah or Creative Artist. That's awesome. I didn't that, that's amazing. I love that. When people think of Tulsa, sometimes I don't think what more now than before, I don't think they thought of fashion. So what gave you the audacity to think that you could go to school and do fashion? Because can I tell you something? Y'all my friends, right? I'm not feeling comfortable with this. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to be a fashion designer whenever I was growing up. Wow. I used to Yeah. I used to watch um, CNN Style with Elsa Clinch. I don't even know if anybody knows what that is. And that's baby telling people how old I am. But if you're young, you don't know anybody. Okay. Um, but yes, I actually went to, well, I went to the University of Oklahoma for architecture, but before that, I thought, I'm going to be a designer, and I've always admired fashion. And so I admire the fact that you had a mind to go for it and pursue it. Why fashion? Wow. Okay, so it's going to get a little deep here, because I feel like fashion um, kind of chose me. I had a very fashionable mom. Who's right there, ladies and gentlemen? Look, she's all ready to go deep. And I can remember like her with the doilies and the stockings, and she would try to dress me up. And me and my brother were always so fly. And 
that was what she was great at, is just being stylish, you know, and just being, you know, on trend, even with not having everything, she would always, you know, make sure we were good. And that's still what she does today. Like, that's still like her top priority. It's like, okay, Tara, you know, like making, <laughs> making sure we're good. And, um, but I, I kind of, when you say I kind of rebelled in that area, like, <laughs> yes, I rebelled heavily. I didn't like the fashion. I didn't like the shopping. I didn't like, because I was a tomboy. And I think um, I was trying to find my way with trying to hang out with my dad under these cars and trying to be in his world and then still um, see this, you know, feminine goddess walk around just making miracles happen. And I really didn't know I could be both. And so, um, and then I went to a school um, at the particular time where I was really affected by, you know, fashion. I went to a school called Cleveland Middle School. And if anybody knows, then you know, you know, it was really like gang infested. Like, and so I remember um, I had to kind of almost dress like a guy, like, you know, just to make sure I wasn't beat up or bullied or like attacked in the bathroom or the locker room, which we saw all the time. So. I always have a secret identity. Mom may not know this. I'm probably going to hear this later. But I used to take clothes to school with me in my dad's clothes. And he, um, he had these button-ups and these overalls and, and these starch, hardcore starch pants, you know, that you can go. And I would put them on and get his belt, tennis shoes. And I would walk to school looking like a crazy person because, you know, I, I had to fit in with, you know, those types of, you know, that environment. And so I really started to kind of have this, okay, when I'm with my mom and on church, we're ladies, you know, when I'm with my dad, you know, I'm kind of like this tomboy. And when I'm at school, I'm a survival mode. You know, I'm whatever I need to be, you know, what's up? You know, so <laughs> that's how I was. So, um, but that kind of really developed kind of really who I am today, but kind of to go where I was saying D, I ended up making some, you know, really poor choices in high school. And um, I ended up getting into a like relationship and I got kidnapped. And so, yeah, so in that situation, and I'm totally fine with it now, like, you know, everybody needs therapy, not for that. But I'm totally fine with it now for promise. So um, in that situation, there was one moment where um, I was kind of like locked in this house and I had one contact missing. And I took my mother through, H E double pocket slips because she was worried and I was just kind of, you know, rebelling and not really knowing who I was. And my idea was I was going to leave and come right back. And I left and couldn't get back, you know. And so um, in this house, I was locked in there and I would always go up into it was a beautiful mansion. And I would go upstairs and see all of these clothes and there were designer clothes from all over the world. And I would try them on. And then I had a sketchbook and I would start to draw. What my, I thought my version of what it would be, especially with me having like only one eye, you know, contact. And by the time I left there, I had an entire book of sketches. And that be, ended up becoming so important to me. Um, it was like my, my artwork, you know, because at that time I was an artist. I was a real painter. I used to draw all the time. And I thought that's what I was going to do for, for, you know, for the rest of my life was a painter or, you know, some type of major, you know, Van Gogh. But um, when I left there, I had a book, and I ended up getting into uh, NSU, Tahlequah, and my mind wasn't right. You know, I just couldn't focus, and, you know, I was kind of traumatized. Oh, that was a traumatic situation. Yeah, it was like three months. And so I went to school at NSU, and, you know, I didn't do well, of course. And my friend at the time, her name was Natalie Sims. She's like a huge superstar at, at this point, but she's amazing as a best friend to me. And um, she ended up going to a school called uh, International Design and Technology in Tampa, Florida. And she um, enrolled me and she filled out my application and everything like on the slide, you know, got me in. And she got me in with that book and she sent my stuff in. And that book I had painted because, you know, we did art, me and Natalie were, were painters. And so, that book, I still have to this day. And when you open it up, you can still smell like you're spinning a polish and the paint's gone. And it just falls apart and tears, but it is so special to me because that moment where I thought, you know, was going to be such a negative and that a word of confusion ends up being 
like the pinnacle and the starting point for everything that I've done and that I'm going to do now. So it ended up being a really major point in my life. And that's why I'm not ashamed to talk about it because there's so many things that you guys are going to go through with you already have it that are major like stones in your in your you know the bricks you know that look like this but they're covered up and you know I feel like I kind of went through those you know and used a couple of them you know so yeah so what maybe was meant maybe to kind of box you in you actually built a wall absolutely that's crazy, that's crazy. And you still have the book. Still have the book. 2020 and this whole COVID thing was that thing for me, the thing that I thought, wow, what am I gonna do? Right. And probably it's the same for a lot of people. Like, what do you mean we can't go to work? We can't do this. I'm working remotely, or wait, I don't have a job, or hold on, you know, it was that thing for me. And I really was like, okay, what do I do? Which was the emphasis for me to start my business. Um, and then I was walking in my house one day and I felt God was like, all right, look. I've been asking you to write this book. And you say you don't have time. Now you're running to do. Mm. Mm. <laughs> you're at home. So I wrote that book. Wow. Started that business, found 36 degrees more to be around other entrepreneurs. That's when I saw you, yes. other people. So it's just amazing how your experiences can bring you to a place that makes you do something that maybe you wouldn't have done had you not had. And it can be considered a negative experience, but like you said, you can turn it into something positive. Yes, yeah. That's awesome. I love that. So that makes sense now, why you said you used to keep bringing people into your house. Because people, we don't know, a lot of people get all types of stuff. So you can bring girls yes. in and care for them because, I don't know. Well, that, that's in my blood. I grew up with um, Brenda Campbell. And so that's my grandmother. And that's my mom's mom. And she, I can remember as a child, there was always traffic. People coming from the bus stops or people coming in and she would, you know, holler and fuss and, you know, and she's a small thing, but she she's a force. And no matter what, she would still find a way to get a pillow and a blanket a cot or a bed and that was just what it was you know and so that a lot of my family were just ingrained to like give back like that because that's what we were taught that's what we saw that's what we knew and, and you think about it now how dangerous is that you know but you know how reckless all the kids and, you know but that's just what it was so now it, I mean it taught you how to you know make sure and that's what community is all about caring for people you know, yes. and walking alongside people when they have, you know, challenges and just being there for people, um, which I feel like is what Black Wall Street is about. Yes. And so in this series, what we do is we have our entrepreneurs tell their story, but we have them also tell the story of what a Black Wall Street pioneers. I think I said that a little bit earlier, but which um, lady, which is Mary Parrish, what did you learn about Mary? Which means it's Mary. I learned that um, you chose this lady for me, but again, it's almost like the universe is just you know aligning things because I realized, um, of course, we all know about you know the, the black entrepreneurs on Greenwood, but just being able to have an assignment to dig a little bit deeper. Um, it was so purposeful and so, you know, on point for me because I realized like this lady and I have so much in common. She's, you know, come to Tulsa, she was born, you know, in Mississippi. My dad's from Mississippi and then she, you know, moved to, you know, Bowley and she got married and then she came to, to Tulsa, you know, to take care of her mom, only for her mom to, you know, pass away six months later and she still stayed. And um, she had heard about Tulsa growing up as a child, learned all these different things about how Tulsa was such a strong community and how they worked together. And what brought her to Tulsa was the spirit and the drive behind the Tulsans here inside the Black community on Black Wall Street. And she, she termed it Negro Wall Street. And so um, she was so inspired and she ended up getting um, an office and, I go to that place all the time. Like it's, you know, it's right there where the old, um, the, the art gallery used to be. And so 
just to see that symmetry there. And then on top of that, she trained on Greenwood. You know, she had a, a company where she taught people how to write and she taught people, she was a journalist. And my mom can tell you, I document everything for like no apparent reason. Like I'm always <laughs> on like, what, what'd you say? I know that's for something later, we right. don't know yet. But that's just a part of my personality. And um, her as a writer and her as a storyteller and her as, um, you know, what I thought was so interesting about her is that her business was so, you know, instrumental in the, the next generations of entrepreneurs. It's almost like she almost had a way of spearheading the, that community to grow and grow because she trained entrepreneurs. She taught them. And I thought that was so amazing because that's really what I feel like I'm here to do is to train entrepreneurs and give back to my community. And hopefully one day someone will be sitting on a platform discussing, you know, what I am wondering what it's going to be one day too, you know, years from now in Tulsa and we're back and booming and, and you know, maybe I'll be up there one day, you know, oh, maybe I randomly pick this. And so I think it's like you said, it must have been for you to present her because I just was like, this is a lady we haven't heard her name. Let's learn more about her. So that's just crazy how yeah. that aligned that you guys have so many parallels. Absolutely. Yeah. Because you do teach the next generation of entrepreneurs and teach people that, yes, this is a fashion industry, but it's what you make it. You know, because with Strut and that first show that you do, you are, and it's Strut, that's short for. Struck for your cause, right? That's correct. Because the entire phrase is struck for your cause. And you wanted to do a fashion show using the skills and talents that you have to bring awareness to endometriosis. That's correct. So tell us about endometriosis. Tell us a little bit about it. I've heard about it, but for those who don't know, sure. So endometriosis is a disease that affects the lining of a woman's uterus and it causes chronic pain. And it keeps them in a um, a normal cycle, usually around their menstrual cycle, um, to where they start to have um, huge episodes. That's what kind of what we call them. My mom would say, I'm having the episode, or I'll say, I'm having the episode. But um, it's a flare up where you feel like you're having contractions, like you're giving birth. And it can last for hours, it can last for days, it can go into the night. A lot of times you're on the floor. And you're, you know, drinking water and, and you're panting and you're you're looking for a way out of that. And for me, I understood it to be where a lot of people commit suicide behind it because not only of the chemical imbalance, the hormonal imbalance that you get, um, but you also it's a, it's pain. It's, it's traumatic. It's, it's literally signing up for like trauma every single month and just dealing with. And so they'll say, okay, there's no cure to it, but we can relieve your uterus. And then you still end up having problems. Um, for me, I had a lot of my problems from high school to college. And then I had an IUD and it kind of really kind of stabilized and pinned me out. But um, I can remember just missing so many school classes and or calling my mom to come pick me up in, in high school or you know, from cramping, and people didn't know why. Like, if you're cramping, take some light off, you know. Like, no, I feel like I'm going to die. You know, I'm probably going to pass out from the pain of it because it's too much for me and my body. And it's playing with my mind, you know, and I'm unstable emotionally because you may be unstable as a female during your cycle, but I've got this, and I'm I'm already dealing with rage issues now. I'm going to, you know, go psycho out, and then the next day I'm fine, you know. So, um, and for me, from the stories that I read, I don't feel like I had it as bad or as bad as my mom or as bad as the um, stories I read when, when I started doing strut, I would get letters and emails from people saying, I was going to kill myself or I almost killed myself or the pain and to find out you're doing awareness for something that I don't think anybody knew about. That helped me understand that just even outside of endometriosis, there are causes that people are dealing with and, and social plights, mental plights, you know, physical, you know, plights that we're dealing with that the world needs to know because if I know that you understand me, it somehow gives me some type of feeling of unity and encouragement and strength just because you know about what I'm going through. And if I know that you can make it, that means that 
that I find right. in it, right? right? That's good. And that's great because, I mean, in entrepreneurship, same thing. I know that if I see you, when I come in and I see you, I'm like, okay, we may not have the same business, but I'm like, see, I've been doing this for 20 plus years. I can make it. I can, I can make it. So whatever it is that you are doing, you know, don't ever think that it's not important. Don't ever think that it's just an idea or it's just an app or it's just a book. Because whatever you're doing, even the book that I wrote about my journey to motherhood, which included infertility. Now, I've gotten so many people saying, hey, I thought I felt alone whenever I was going through that. Like, why do I keep going through this? And so I just I was determined, and I feel like you're the same way, to turn that pain into purpose and to say, okay, if I'm going through, going through this, somebody's going to be blessed. Somebody's going to be encouraged from this pain. I'm not going to just allow the pain to just be. I'm going to turn it into purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. That's amazing. So, speaking of strength, so far, let me go back. Black Wall Street. I grew up learning about Black Wall Street. When did you learn about Black Wall Street? I had a um, lady I used to babysit for. Her name was Sherry Tisdale. And we ended up rolling into such a special union where she eventually, you know, became my godmother. Like my mother gave her the right and said, okay, this is almost like your dog. So, um, and so I call her Aunt Sherry. And um, Uncle William and, and grandmother, um, who is um, Maxine, the late Maxine Horner, um, they would have programs um, in the culture center. And I am a Greenwood lady. I grew up in Greenwood, from the dance classes to the stages and running around and, you know, being told to sit down. Or, you know, like I, you know, we did the, the jazz, you know. Um, with um, Uncle Chuck Sissel, and we did all those, you know, musicals and things like that. And so it, um, it enriched me and really gave me an opportunity to kind of think outside the box and really invest mentally back into my own understanding of the culture and the, the past. And um, being at the cultural center, seeing all those statues and pictures and all those things that, you know, we just walked past, but we were there, you know, sitting and, and watching you know, from the development to it's there, it's there now. You know, and I would watch the uh, the meetings that grandmother would have about the culture center, and then it was there, and then it was, you know, so all those things, um, for me, I always felt like, especially now in retrospect, um, that I was born here, maybe brought back here for, you know, a purpose that is solely related to Black Wall Street because of just the insights and the places and the things that I kind of ended up in. You know, um, how do you, you know, end up going to church with your mom and then end up with, you know, the people who are solely connected with Greenwood and learn all about that and, you know, have those ties. And so, and I don't think it's just me. I'm going to take a side rail here, but I don't know if a lot of people believe in like past lives and things like that, but just think for one second, what if you were in that generation of the 1920s? What if you or you were one of those entrepreneurs? You know, and I don't really believe in, if I believe in past lives, but I don't believe that they have a color barrier. I don't believe that you can come, you know, you can come back the same color. I believe that we all have experiences. And so for me, in that mindset, I don't necessarily think that if, if I believe that we're all here, if you're entrepreneurs and you're in Tulsa, what if you were really one of those people who had a, a business back in Wall Street? You know, and what if you are not black? But what if you were then, you know, and you are sitting here today as an entrepreneur coming to restore this community? in Tulsa. And so kind of going a little bit outside the box because I like to think outside and kind of sit over and look at it a little bit, turn it around, right? And so for me, my pride as an African-American and, and my soul ties to this, you know, Black community and for Black Wall Street are there and they're thriving and running through me. But I also have to consider, you know, what if we're all, what if it's something way bigger, you know, and we're all contributing to Black Wall Street. We're all repairing Black Wall Street. And we're all supposed to be in Tulsa for such a time as this, but yeah. 
I do, I feel that myself. Like I was, I said in a, another show that I was reading a book to my daughter um, about Black Wall Street. And I had this, it wasn't an out of body experience, but it was just like surreal. Like, wow, I just felt like it was, the moment was bigger than me, you know? And I don't remember ever feeling like that. I was just like, I'm supposed to be doing this right now. Yeah. I thought that I was just coming to 36 degrees work to get a part time job and get out of my house because they were driving me bananas during COVID. <laughs> and they weren't doing anything. I just was like, I need to get out of these four months. But then when I got here, I was like, wow, I'm supposed to be here. You know, it, it felt really like it was beyond me. And I don't believe you. And I talked about this. We don't know if we have any direct ties to Black Wall Street, but we do. We're here for a reason. So even if we're not descendants directly, then we are, I do believe we're all here to do our parts. Whether we're Black or white or red or green or brown, it doesn't matter. So yeah, we're here to play a part. Absolutely. So you already said that. And thank you for sharing that. I love that you get outside the box with that. Oh, and I wanted to shout out you said Chuck Sissel. That's my dad's cousin. Ah. That's one thing about Tulsa, y'all. That's so small. So small. So please don't burn up bridges. Someone will find somebody at home. Oh, 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 I know Abby. I know Jamie. You know, it's so little, so small. But shout out to cousin Chuck. Oh, Chuck too. Yes. That's my dad's uh, cousin. But yes, he's an amazing musician. Yes. He's an amazing brother. Incredible. It has a lot to do with the culture that you see now. Um, during that time frame, we would leave Tulsa. I can remember saying, I'm getting out of here as fast as I can. I get Tulsa, you know, nothing to do here. And I walk around and I, now I hear young folks say, man, it's boring here, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have like 50,000 things, so way more they, things to do. Downtown wasn't even a thing. Then, right, what downtown? You know, like we were. Yeah, it's like, are you okay? Yeah, you yeah, have to yeah, yeah. buy? All right. Yeah. Call me when you get out. <laughs> <laughs> but now, you know, it's like popping and, and you, you can still hear it. And I think that's just going to be what young people feel like because it's our need to get out and explore. But I also want to charge any person that's listening that's going to college. I really do feel like you are born in a certain place to benefit that place, to, to, to bring forth something out of that. And so it's good to go out and experience, go out, gain, collect, and then come back and start to build your storehouse and start to, de to deliver the things that you've learned and, you know, educate the people who haven't gone and probably will not, you know. Yeah. So it's okay to go outside of town. It's okay to come outside of Tulsa, but come back home and let's restore. Let's, let's rebuild because they get what you want to do. Absolutely. Because there's something special here with Tulsa. Like, this is historical, you know, Tulsa is historical. And, and why is it historical? It's not just because of what happened on Greenwood, as far as, you know, the massacre. And it's not just about that. It was what happened before, before the massacre. There's a spirit that's here. There's something that resides on these streets and in these walls yeah. and in these buildings. And so it's something that, you know, we're all called to just by being and living in Tulsa. The moment you whether you grew up here or not, the moment you decided to reside here, you became a part of it. And so I really truly believe that, you know, there is, there's an antidote that Tulsans have. And, and I don't want to say had, have, and have access to it. Why do I say that? Because 1921, there was a reason why they were, you know, experiencing this massacre and, and our home was burnt down and we were attacked. There was a reason for that. And that was because Black Wall Street had the antidote for oppression, for racial oppression. We had the antidote for how to succeed beyond measure, beyond understanding, beyond you know anybody's wildest imagination. We were dream makers. Like that spirit existed. And you tap into it when you come downtown. And that's why we love going downtown. I don't know why I love going downtown. <laughs> You know, but that's why, you know, because we can sense it, we can feel it, you know, and and I think that we all understand it in some type of way, you know, but we have access to that same potential. It's a potency. And, and I think that once we decide to actually live in that, breathe in it, dive in it, because like she said, I was attracted to the way the community came together and they thrive the spirit of the community. And so now you have to understand looking forward now, 
what do we have to do? We have to operate as a community, you know, and it just so happens to be that a lot of those people are artists, they're creative artists, they're, they're, they're texts, they're, you know, and it's all about being a creator. And that's how I look at, you know, people who, you know, are entrepreneurs. I look at you guys as creators, you know, and that's so important that you kind of split the mind for a second. Just like you have to split the mind and be a business person as well as a creative artist. Yeah, you've got to also split that into one more third block. You know, I'm a creator. And, and a problem solver. Yeah. yeah. The answer is always there. And I, I tell my son that all the time. The answer is always there. You know, <laughs> it's always there. And that's our job. It's almost our responsibility. Our, our, our birthright and also our, our amendment that we need to come in and find, you know, solutions, not just for, you know, the next app or the next, you know, device or the next clothing line or but really for people who we haven't even thought of yet, 10, 15 years, you know, you're gonna be sitting in a position 10 years from now to where all the things that you learned and went through will apply to someone else's journey, you know? That's really good. It's so good. It's funny because you said that, you know, Black Wall Street had that spirit. Now it forever will stand that beacon to not just Black entrepreneurs, but entrepreneurs everywhere and especially it's special for us as black entrepreneurs because now like nobody can tell me that I cannot because I know it exists right so if it existed that means I can do it too and I'm so grateful I've said this before like in the past um, episodes that I'm so grateful for my parents because you can't be what you don't see and even if I can't physically see it if you tell me about it I was talking to um, my friend actually Dom of Act House today and he was saying, whenever exposure is very dangerous, because once you expose me to something, then I'm like, well, I see it now. I can, I can have it. I can do it. I can be it. It's very, very dangerous. And it's good. It's good and dangerous because now it's like, okay, well, I know there was a Black Wall Street. My five year old was just literally having a conversation walking. She was like, okay, so mommy, something about like, how do we rebuild Black Wall Street? And I promise y'all, this five year old is like a stage. <laughs> I don't know, baby. Wow. I ask her because I feel like kids have so much wisdom that we, we think because they're little, they don't have it. She's like, how can we redo it? She looked at the view and was like, hmm. But I love that that's even just on her mind. Yes. You know? Yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's kudos to you there, you know? And then I give kudos to my parents, mm -hmm. you know? And that just gave me chills because that's just, it's just great because I feel a lot of times people think, oh, you. You are an architect or you're a doctor. And it's just like, really, it all boils down to exposure. My dad's a doctor. Or my aunt's a dentist. Or, you know, yes. my best friend's a fashion designer. Or whatever. You got exposed to it, so now you're like, oh, that's not out of reach to me. I'm not out of reach. So I want to talk about Strug. This is August, right? September. Strug has something special coming up. Tell us about that. Wow, it's a, it's one month away. Wow, I just realized that I gotta go. <laughs> I'm like, please don't think about it. I know yeah. I'm planning that you put me in so I'm like, okay, let's not go there. I shouldn't have said that, but yes, tell us about structs. September 11, doors open at 3:30 for a Q and A panel. Industry professionals are going to discuss um, their kind of similar to what I'm doing. You know, discuss their platforms and um, offer answers to questions that are asked. And then the lovely Tara Payne will also be our MC. Shh. Oh, hey. I'm just kidding. Yes. I'm so excited about it. Yeah, and so she's gonna have a, a list of just knockout questions and, and hopefully that will inspire you know the audience, you know, to come. And it's not just you know fashion lovers, dancer lovers, you know, industry lovers, art lovers. Um, I want everyone who thinks they're a stylist to be to make sure you're there. You know, if you are a hairstylist, a makeup stylist, um, and then also going into production, you know, for, for, for tech, for logo, for, you know, videography, you know, cinem cinematography, photography, all those things, um, you should be there because strut is what I call a visual catalyst. It's something that I put on every year to kind of show as a visual demonstration of what I would like to be presenting with my college, with the school, the House of Selah. My goal is to have a school where it's um, it's a home, and it's really truly a reflection, a, a mirror reflection of 
what I've been doing all this time, which is bringing people into my home, loving on them and educating them and pouring something, you know, besides, you know, doubt, and, and, you know, and, and you better, you know, and I, and I got a little bite, I got a whole lot of bite, you know, but I still know how to love on people because that's what was given to me and giving them a trade, you know, not everybody's gonna be in fashion. You may be an artist or you may be a graphic designer, you may be able to, you know, produce music or, you know, um, do logos, websites and all those things. Those are things that I teach from web design, graphic design, to fashion design. And I kind of, you know, had a chip on my shoulder when people say, oh, you're a model agent. Like, that's not all that I do. You know, like people who come to my talent agency learn everything from production, stage handling, lighting, graphic design, web development, you know, um, to learn how to make a flyer. And so I don't like being pigeonholed or put into a box because I feel like I'm so much bigger than, than a shape, you know, and, that's what I'm kind of encouraging people to be, you know, no labels, you know, no limitations, you know, feel what you are and, and live in those moments because it will often shift and transfer and move into something new. And then you'll come right back to it 15 years later, like, oh, that's why I did that. That's why I was there and it worked me all the time. And so you build and you add, you know, and, and the only thing you should be subtracting are negative, negative, negative moments, feelings, people, experiences, environments. That's the only thing you should subtract. That's why it's called subtract. You know, like get rid of the negative. That's why it's a negative, right? That line, you know, <laughs> take it out, you know, and so, or you put it with another one and turn it into a positive, you know, cross, hallelujah, okay. you know, so, but anyway. <laughs> I can go off on tangents, sorry. I wanted, so you said September 11th. Did we say what exactly was going on in September 11th? The Shrub Fashion Year. Okay, you gotta be there. Doors open again, this is why I started. Q&A panel, 3.30. And the fashion show starts at 5 p.m. It is outdoors in lieu of our COVID-19. You know, it's been lurking around.